So our final scripture reading comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verses 13 through 24. Hear Paul's words to the, to the church in Galatia. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I had advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me. But I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cyphus, and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by the sight by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it and said, The one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorify God because of me. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, as we gather, as we remember your last meal with your disciples. As we remember the great works you have done for Israel, the great works you have done throughout history, give us a heart to remember, to see how you have moved and where your love and grace have lived in our lives. And in remembering God, call us forward to mirror that love and grace into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. I think it might be safe to say that our culture at times has a fractured relationship with the past. We remember it with rose-colored glasses failing to see the ways that we have changed and grown for the better and made the world better than it was. Sometimes we often wish for a return to the past as a rejection of now. Yet for many, what is behind us is better left untouched. Some of us don't like to look back on what was on the past. We say things like, let the past lie, or you can't change the past. Let's not dwell on it. Or from the Disney movie, The Lion King, uh, Timon, the meerkat, says, you need to leave the past behind you, in which case Pumbaa says, you need to leave your behind in the past. We see both of these responses and how we remember our history. Often things in our history go missing. We don't want to talk about certain things, and other things get highlighted and get put with certain perspectives. Isn't it a central issue in our world now that many people fail to remember the past in its fullness and pick and choose what they want to discuss, sometimes at the expense of telling the whole truth? If there was anyone with reason to forget their past, it was Paul. His previous life seems like a 180 from who he was when he wrote the letter that we are reading from today. He persecuted Christians, and now he was inviting people to become followers of Christ. It would have been totally understandable, and I think many of us would have, would have sympathized or empathized with Paul if he just wanted to completely forget his past and put it behind him and not think of it anymore. So why, in this letter to Galatia, as he's trying to be persuasive and authoritative, when you look throughout the letter, he's trying to be persuasive to this church, why does Paul remind us of his past? Why does he bring up that he used to be one of the bigger, biggest persecutors of Christians? Why is Paul willing to remember who he was, even while it contradicts who he is? Paul shows us, That remembrance is a way of inviting the love of God to transform and grow us. As he says to the Galatians, his story 
makes people say, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Paul is choosing not to give his past the power of hiding in the midst of him because our past is a part of us. Paul is not pretending like it didn't happen. He is naming it and he knows its presence. He knows the wrongs he's made. And Paul recognizes that God has taken control, not just of his future, but of his past. That if Paul had just ignored it, his past would have still been within him. Its power still latent within his identity It would have held fear over him that a church like the church in Galatia would have found out. I think about how oftentimes people of power and report and celebrity in our own society want to bury their past. They fail to admit when they've made mistakes. They fail to talk about misconceptions they had. They they just want to leave things in the past and they don't want to talk about it. They have some fear there. That that past is still affecting them. They just don't want to talk about it. But I'm also reminded of the practice of truth-telling that happens in recovery programs, such as Alcoholics Anonymous, or like what happened in South Africa after apartheid, where in order for these people and these nations and and these communities to claim their new selves apart from what was broken, they revisit past harms that were committed, that they committed, not to sit in that guilt, not to be defined by what they did wrong, but to recognize it, to make amends, to let the power of the redemptive love of God speak into it and change them. A debate has been happening in our larger society recently about how we should remember the mistakes of America's past, the mistakes of Europe's past, the mistakes of the world's past. What good does it do to remind ourselves of things like segregation or slavery or the harm caused to native populations and communities? But I wonder if our society isn't much different from Paul. If we desire to be defined by love, respect, care, compassion, we have to know our past. We have to own it and confront it as Paul did and know that the love of God is powerful enough even to redeem it. Sometimes when we remember the harsh and difficult things of our past, we are allowing the power of God's love to break in and start healing rather than allowing the power of fear of it to hide it and allow it to fester away. On a personal level, I think about my family, the brokenness we've experienced from my father and his inability to name the ways that he harmed our family, that that created a gap for us to repair our future where we're choosing to avoid each other rather than to speak into the past and to let God redeem it. Paul shows us that to remember the hard parts of our past is to invite the love of God and the grace of God control over these things, to allow Christ to initiate the process of remaking us apart from our past. But we have to face our past to do that, the big and the small things. One of the practices we talk about when we can do that is the examine prayer, where we look back over past events and we pray over them to see, how did I let the love of God live in me, and how did I not let the love of God live in me? That's a way of honoring our past and speaking to where we may have made mistakes. But remembrance is not a wholly negative thing, right? Our other two verses are positive. In fact, in Scripture, we are often called to remember the goodness of our life, the goodness of God we have witnessed. But we do not remember the goodness to dwell in nostalgia. Remembering the good prepares us even more to be followers of Christ, to be the body of Christ in the world. In our reading from Deuteronomy, which I admit was kind of an odd reading for us today, God is speaking to Israel about how they will live in community. He is preparing Israel with, with commandments, with laws, with promises, how they will live on the pro- in the promised land together, how they will live as a nation. But rooted in, in his plan, in his structure for the chosen nation of God, for Israel's future, is the call to remember. Remember the work and the goodness of God in Egypt, in the desert, and now. Israel is given the responsibility to remember 
how they have witnessed God's love, faithfulness, and grace. They are the bearers of God's redemptive story into the future so that that could continue. That past is not just a story to tell. It's a reminder of how they can live into the future. I'll never forget the first world religions class I took in high school. I, we studied all the different major world religions in the world, including Christianity. And our teacher split Christianity into two sections. They, she split it into Christian history before 100 AD, what we would know as biblical Christian history, and the history of the Catholic Church, what happened after 100 AD and the formation of the Catholic Church and the Great Schism and the Protestant Reformation. And without studying, I, as someone who was raised in the church, got an A on the first section. I knew my Bible history. I had read my Bible because that was my faith. But much to the surprise of my friend next to me who was not a Christian and did not care about Christianity, he got an A on the second section and I failed the second test. I failed the second test on Christianity I've come a long way since then. I, I didn't study, and I fell victim to the mistake many Protestant churches make, which is rejecting the goodness of God in the story past the Bible, that God has been present in other ways in our history of our faith, in our tradition. I was taught that not much mattered after the Bible, but I failed to see how God's love was continuing to work in history after 100 AD. I rejected the, the opportunity to remember these things, which is funny because as, a, as Methodist, I wasn't a Methodist at the time, but as Methodist, John Wesley reminds us that tradition, the history of our church, is one way for us to, to grow in faith and see God. As Protestants, we often focus on what we believe apart from what we've experienced, but our experience of God's goodness are meant to help us better know how to follow God in the future. Israel understood this. At least at times they understood this. They made their mistakes. But their future was made better when they could remember the power and love of God from their past. And so we practice remembrance, not just to see how far God has changed us, but also to see where God has been before. To look back, to name that here I saw God, here I experienced God, gives us courage when we have doubt. It allows us to worship when worship might me seem futile. And the love of God from before helps show us new ways to love God in the future. The people of God are blessed with millions of memories of God's goodness, both small and large to help us continue to be the people of God into the future. From the story of the Exodus, to the fight for equality for all people, to the story of Jesus giving his life on the cross, to the prayers that your grandparents taught you, to the moments with friends in church praying over a friend you're worried about. When we remember God's mighty hand and outstretched arm, we see that God is also moving in our future. You might say the church was formed around our remembering. In our gospel message today, Jesus leaves his disciples with the main thing. He leaves them with a lot of main things. And it's a main thing that they will forget in the very next section of Luke when they begin to bicker about who is greater than each other. But the church has long used the remembrance of Jesus as the central act of our worship, communion. The Greek word that Jesus uses in this book of, of, of Luke is when he says, remember me, he says it means to be reminded of or to be mindful of. That as the church exists, we are to be mindful of Jesus' body and blood given for us. It's not just a matter of stopping and remembering, though that's important, but it's a member, it's it's about keeping that truth in front of us as we move forward. The love of God shown in Christ, remembering those acts. In his last few hours with his disciples, before Jesus goes with the cross, he stresses the importance of remembering what he is about to do. Jesus hasn't been arrested yet. 
And he hasn't been crucified or resurrected yet, but he wants his disciples to shape the future of the church around this remembering, the remembering, this memory of his self-emptying sacrificial love. The remembrance of Jesus' sacrificial self-emptying love was meant to order the church and to lead us into the expanse ahead of us. Here is the moment where we are reminded And by being reminded, we can be that body and blood of Christ for the world. Would you pray with me? God, as we celebrate communion, remind us, help us be mindful of a Christ whose body and blood are given for us. Help us be mindful of a God whose outstretched arm guides us. Remind us of the ways that we have seen you before. Give us moments of pause to recognize where your love and grace have gone before so that we may trust that it will be with us in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. So on the night Jesus was betrayed, just as we read, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and said, this is my body given for you. Each time you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it and he said, this is my blood shed for you. And every time you eat of this bread and drink of this blood, drink of this cup, you do so in remembrance of me. And so we pray that Holy Spirit, you would pour out on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and juice, that you would make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours forever, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. So I invite us Maybe you have elements at home. Maybe you're about to eat a meal. That as we eat today, we do so remembering Christ's love. Maybe we remember the cross. That on it, Christ gives his body and blood to us. To show us love. To redeem us. Maybe it's another way that Christ's love has been present in your life. A family member who has cared for you. A friend who has been there for you in tough times. Maybe it's been a moment where the love of God was just present in some way when things looked awful, but you were carried through. As we eat this meal together, as we celebrate communion together, let us remember Christ who calls us into a life of remembrance, not as living in the past, but as preparing and living into the future. Let's join in this feast together. Amen.